Hey, how's everybody doing? All right. You guys ready for a funny story? I got to make sure it doesn't take up too much of my sermon. I could tell this for like a half hour, all the things that went on. Hey, uh, have any of you ever been scuba diving? Oh, okay, like a couple. Yeah, I've been snorkeling. I'm a pro at snorkeling. But I've always wanted to do to go scuba diving. Uh, it's one of my, like, I just I have to do this before I die. And uh, uh, I used to be a fish in a previous life. So, like, that was, it's really important. I'll preach that in another church someday. But um, so my wife and I went to a conference down in Cancun a couple years ago. And she had her session. So I said, why don't you go to your session and learn so much and very valuable chiropracticness uh, informations. And I'll go scuba diving. <laughs> and she didn't want to anyway, so that was like a fair trade. So um, I, I signed myself up. I got there. I signed my name on the dotted line that I won't sue them if I die. And, uh, and then they train you. They immediately train you. Okay, this is what you got to do. You got to know the, these vocabulary words. You got to know how to do it. What's it called? The oxygen air, the, 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 the vest that you have on, which has air in it that can like, you can inflate it with air so you're, you're, you float up or you can deflate it and sink down. So I'm learning all these things. Well, then one of the things they have you do, you're in the pool, you're under the water, and you have your mask on. And they say, all right, let the water in your mask so you feel like you're drowning. Is this exciting? Who wants to do it? And you feel like you're drowning. Like, don't worry. We'll show you how to get out of this. And you're supposed to put two fingers on the top of the mask and... And you blow as, as hard as you can out. And it, it pushes the water out of your mask and you stick it against your face. So if you're 30 meters under the water and you're going to die, just go like this. Your p- complete presence of mind, everything will be great. <laughs> and each thing that they teach me, I'm like, I'm going to die. <laughs> I, like, I, but this is what I, I've always wanted to do this. So they let you swim around in the pool for a little bit. I felt good. No one was watching me. I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Well... We go out in the boat, and the, the waves are like 10-foot swells. I, I went into the water. Well, there's a couple other things that happened. But I went to the water and immediately, like, started getting slapped with waves. I couldn't catch my breath. I'm like, how are you supposed to do this? And before I jumped in the water, they had this little spray. You spray on your, on your mask so it doesn't fog up. It, it smelled awful, and so immediately I had this, like, nauseous feeling. So I was nauseous. Uh, I, this, I couldn't stand the smell. The waves were crashing in my face, and also they have this little belt of rocks around your waist, except when I fell in the water, I couldn't tighten it, and it fell down around my legs. And so I'm like, that's a Bible verse, you know, woe to you who has stones tied around, oh my gosh. I said, this is not going well. Okay, so if that's not bad enough, then on top of that, the guy who I just trained with, I'm like, okay, if this guy can do it, I can do it. He starts throwing up everywhere. He admitted to me that he had had a little wild night the, the evening before and was a little uh, plastered. So he starts throwing up in the ocean and there's chunks everywhere. I'm like, ah. So then the, the instructor's like, leave him alone. Um, here, come over to the buoy and there's a line that goes down a wire and then I'm supposed to let the air out and go underwater. And he said, once you're underwater, everything will change. You'll, be, you'll feel comfortable. Everything will be great. Except then he lets the air he lets the air out, not me, and starts pushing on my head. (laughs) Listen, I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest. It was the perfect storm of awfulness. I did not go scuba scuba diving that day. I was scared to death, and the anxiety was, like, overwhelming. I've never had an anxiety attack until that day, and I've never had one since. But just telling the story makes me feel, but it's so embarrassing. Everyone else, you know, 10 of you have been scuba diving before. Take me with you. I want to try it again, but everyone says you got to do it in a lake. Okay, that's my story. Here's the point of the story. They told me everything I would need to know. They told me what I would need, how to prepare, what I should do in case of an emergency. They gave me all the information. I just, I didn't know what to do with it. And I was scared. I let fear creep in, which, which it made me not participate to get the blessing of what they told me to be ready for. Does any of that make sense? We're going to go into the scriptures today, and we're going to talk about all the things God told the Israelites to do. He gave them everything, every contingency plan. Let's talk about it. So we're going to start with then. Okay, there's Hebrews, then, 
end now. We're going to start off with then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Here's what it says. We're going to go through lots of scripture because some of these stories, you're going to, I'm going to read it right now. And you're going to be like, I have no idea what they're talking about. This is confusing. The Bible is confusing. And hopefully we'll make some clarity out of it. Verse 18, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I am trembling with fear. You know, that's why Hebrews is so intriguing. If you don't know the Old Testament, it's just confusing. I mean, if there was a haunted roller coaster called Terror Mountain, I would go on it. But this is scary. This is, this is crazy. What are they even talking about? So I want to tell you the story that's found in the book of Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to go through. I'm going to read you a passage of scripture. And this is what was happening so that this story makes sense for you. Okay? Is everyone on board? All right, here we go. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day... The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch even the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and there was lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire, and the smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. It was like an earthquake. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Now I'm going to jump to the next chapter, chapter 20. It says, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning, and they heard the trumpet, and they saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. This is what you have to understand. This is what you have to understand, because that's terrifying, right? It's trembling. It causes you to be full of fear just thinking about it, because it's, it's not just a rainstorm. Okay, this is God descending on the mountain. This is thunder and lightning, and, and the people are so scared. They, they say, Moses, we don't want to even hear from God. You tell us what God says, and then we'll just do it. This is what you have to understand. Israel had just come out of 400 years of slavery. Israel had just come out of 400 years of being oppressed by a foreign people, the Egyptians. Israel had just come out of 400 years of a mindset of subjugation. Israel had just come out of 400 years of false God indoctrination. False gods everywhere. Where's your God? I mean, year number two, I'd be a little bit frustrated. Year 389, 400 years. But you know what God was doing? He was rewiring them. He was rewiring the people, showing them again, even after 10 plagues of Egypt, who he is. He would say, I am God and there is no other. You shall have no other gods before me. And that's what happens. The next chapter, God gives them the Ten Commandments. This is who I am. 
This is who you're to worship. You're not to worship those gods of the Egyptians. You're not to worship Pharaoh. You saw what happened to Pharaoh, his firstborn, dead. Pharaoh was a god to the Egyptians. If Pharaoh was a god, how come that god cannot keep his own firstborn son alive? Who was to be the next god, Pharaoh? God was showing them who he was. Nonetheless, the scene is scary, it's ominous, it's terrifying, it's like a pyrotechnic show with thunder and lightning, trumpet blasts. God is trying to burn this, this whole situation, this whole, uh, you know, event into their collective conscience on who he is and what is expected of them. And the heavy burden of it all is that disobedience is met with the consequence of death. You weren't even allowed to approach the mountain. That was then. Now, let's skip down to verse 22. But you have come to a different mountain. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You have come to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, who is judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I've said this pretty much every time I've preached. Once again... The author is reaffirming that the audience that he's talking to are believers. This is new covenant believers whose names are written in the book of life. All the language here is clear and specific. You've come to Jesus. He's the mediator of this new covenant you've accepted. And the sprinkled blood, which speaks a better word than the old covenant. Now we're talking about a a new mountain, Mount Zion. Raise your hand if you know what Mount Zion is. A few of you. Very good. Very good. I want to talk about Mount Zion, all right? Because you got to know these stories. Every Israelite, every Hebrew person that this book is written to, they grew up with all the stories. They grew up trying to memorize the Torah and trying to read through the prophets. They, They ate, slept, and drank, the Bible says. Like, the parents were to teach it to their children, and their children to their children, and their children to their children. And this is what they did because they didn't have Netflix, and they didn't have Starbucks. So this is, they... They got home from a a day's work, and they sat around the table, and they went over the law of God. They went over the law of Moses. So how many of you know what Mount Moriah is? Mount Moriah. A couple of you know what Mount Moriah is. This is such a cool story. Only God could write a story like this that is just woven through the whole entire Bible. So it all starts with a man named Abraham. Raise your hand if you know who Abraham is. Okay, we're getting closer. All right, common ground. There's Abraham. God tells Abraham, you're going to have a son in your old age. Sarah thinks he's crazy because she's 80 years old when she hears it and 90 years old when she actually has a son. How many women are thankful? (laughs) Never mind, okay. Uh, So she has a son, and God says to Abraham, this son I am going to cause to happen through this son that you will have so many ancestors and so many descendants you will not be able to even count them. Now, this son, so many ancestors, sand on the seashore, I want you to kill him. Take him up to Mount Moriah and, and sacrifice him for me. Now, we don't know this from the story. You could look at the story and be like, well, maybe he... What was Abraham thinking? But guess what? Hebrews chapter 11 that we just went through a couple weeks ago tells us Abraham was confident that even if he went through with it, even if he killed his son Isaac, his one and only son, through whom would come all these descendants as much as the sand on the seashore, even if he killed him, God was able to raise him up to life again. That's what was going on in Abraham's mind. So he takes him up to Mount Moriah, and his son's like, where's the sacrifice? Ah, that, I mean, I just can't wait to watch the movie when we get to heaven about how that all, you know, <laughs> happened. He, we all know the story. He gets to the top. Abraham's getting ready. God says, ah, okay, now I know that you will not even withhold. God wasn't going to do it anyway because it's all a foreshadowing of what was to come. Because what ha- Mount Moriah 
King David changed the name to Mount Zion. So King David comes in the land, captures Jerusalem, which is Mount Moriah is just one of the mountains in Jerusalem. King David captures it and builds his princely, kingly palace in Mount Zion, the city of David. Thousands of years later, Jesus comes. It's, it's called Mount Zion. Jesus dies on Mount Zion. King Solomon built a temple before Jesus died. I missed one. King Solomon builds the temple on Mount Zion. So you've got Abraham who's going to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, which is Mount Zion. King David changes the name to Mount Zion. King Solomon builds the temple, and guess what happened in the temple? The blood of the animals was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant on Mount Zion. Where the blood of Abel would have been shed, but God provided a ram, so the ram's blood was shed. Jesus then dies on Mount Zion. Jesus starts the church on Mount Zion. It all happens on Mount Zion, which is Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. And so there's this freight. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Oh, this is so good. So I want to read two passages of the scripture. First, we're going to go into Isaiah 2, because this, God spoke of these things. He had this beautiful plan before anything happened. Isaiah chapter 2. This is what, it's not going to be on the screen. Write it down. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. We're going to find out just how high in a second. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not take up sword against nation and they will not train for war. Do you see how if you grew up reading the scroll of Isaiah, this passage would make very good sense. You're tracking like, oh, he said Mount Zion. Abraham, Jake, okay. Uh, David, Solomon, Jesus. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. We've come to Mount Zion. We're, we didn't come to Mount Sinai. We came to Mount Zion. This is where we're coming. This is so good. And Isaiah prophesied that these things would happen. Wait a second. Are we beating our swords into plowshares? No, there's still war. There's still war right now. So this passage in Isaiah is talking about a a future time. I believe it's the millennial kingdom when God is going to come. Jesus is going to sit on the throne of Jerusalem and there's going to be perfect peace all over the earth. I want to read you from Revelation 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. You remember when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you? In my father's house are many rooms. Okay, remember that? I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Do you remember when God walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve? And because of their sin, he no longer walked in the cool of the day with them? And they were asked to leave that perfect garden. Do you remember that? There's coming a day when God will once again dwell with man. We will live with him. We will abide with him. He will dwell with us. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Ready? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain for the old order of things has passed away. So this, this one, there's one sentence, okay? But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. One sentence. 
Do you see how rich that one sentence is in the Bible? Do you see how awesome it is to study the word of God and dig through it and try to understand what this is meaning? Oh, this verse, that applies to the Old Testament when this happened. And it's, it's remarkable how beautiful it is. Do you know how high the city is? It actually gives the measurement in the book of Revelation. You know, the top of this building is like, I think, 30 feet or something. The top of, like, the, the peak of the roof, 33 feet. I don't know, something like that. Um, the top of the city is 1,400 miles high. Outer space is two miles. If you go up two miles, that's outer space. The city of God that is coming down out of heaven, that Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place, mm, you're going to love it. He's bringing it down, and it's going to be 1,400 miles high. And 1,400 miles, okay, all these things are for another day. This is exciting stuff. Go search it out. So good. So you see what mountain the Hebrews have come to. You see what mountain you and I have come to. Not to Mount Sinai, not to fear and trembling, not to um, terrifying thunder. and light. We have come to Mount Zion the new Jerusalem, the city coming out of heaven that Jesus is preparing for us right now. Okay, it goes on to say, you've come to thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You know, it cracks me up when, you know, whatever. I won't make too much of it, but I love it. People, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and just be with Jesus and worship and love him and be loved by him. And people are like, seriously, Tim, we're going to sit there for hundreds of years and just worship God. And There's going to be this fat, chubby little baby with a harp, and we're going to, that's gross. But I think about it like this. Um, have any of you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Couple? Oh, man, you got to go. You got to go. It's so beautiful. And so this is what happened. This is what happened when my wife and I had a chance because of a chiropractic conference. Man, I thank you, babe. Those chiropractic conferences get me around the world, although I didn't go scuba diving. <laughs> okay. I, I've wanted to go all my life. My mom's trying to like, let's all go as a family. To, so we were able to go, and it was wonderful. You know what happened? <clears throat> I was walking around. The very first thing we came to, I took a picture, a selfie of me and Amy. It was so beautiful. Now, this picture doesn't do it justice. It was remarkable. You know what it was? It was stunningly beautiful, impossible to beat, and the view was absolutely exquisite. Oh, then I took a couple more steps, and I found this. And it was stunningly beautiful and impossible to beat, and the view was exquisite. And then we drove down the road like a little ways, and I saw this. And there's the Colorado River. It's so like blue-green, and it's running right through, and it's so beautiful. Look at that. It's unbelievable. No matter where I went, I just saw another glimpse. I saw another view, and it was so beautiful, and I wanted to keep taking more pictures, and I'm like, they're all the same thing, but they're different, and they're beautiful, and it just it caught me again. And that's what heaven's going to be like, folks. There's no such thing as, I'm going to get bored. There's no such thing. You're going to see God, and you're going to be undone. You know what it says about the 24 elders and the four living creatures? It says they cast their crowns down, and they gaze upon him, and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they open up their eyes, and they do it again. And then they open up their eyes, and they do it again. There's no getting bored. Okay, I just wanted to throw that out there. Thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly, praising the creator God. It's going to be an amazing thing. We didn't come to Sinai. We came to the new Jerusalem with thousands of angels looking at Jesus in all of his glory. Verse 23, it says, you've come to the church of the firstborn. There's different ways to understand this this word firstborn, but do you know Jesus is called the firstborn in several different passages? One, he's called the firstborn of the dead because, um, like, um, what's his name? Lazarus. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out of the tomb, but guess what? He died again. He might have lived for another 20 or 30 years, but he died again. He didn't go to heaven straight away. Jesus was the first one to die 
and be resurrected never to ever die again. So he's the firstborn of the dead. In Colossians, he's called the firstborn over all creation. And then in Romans, he's called the firstborn among many brethren. It's a title, the word firstborn is a title of preeminence. It's a title of honor. Jesus is first place. And it goes on to say, whose names are written in heaven. So that goes right along with, he's the firstborn among many brethren. All these brethren who believed because of the apostles' word. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples and teach them. And that's what people did. And now there's many brethren. It goes on to say that you've come to God, the judge of all, that's Jews and Gentiles, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. What? Why is this so confusing? To the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Well, I was thinking about that too. (laughs) Two times that I've preached through the book of Hebrews, it has this phrase in it. Like, that's weird. I guess God's trying to teach me something. But it has this phrase, the righteous men made perfect. What does that mean? Perfect. What? And... When I was reading the commentaries, it said it was Jewish tradition, okay? Not a biblical teaching, just the tradition of the Jewish people. That when you lived a righteous life, there was, there was like nothing better, a crowning moment, than to be persecuted for your faith as you lived your life in righteousness and to be martyred as the last thing. It was like perfection. You live for God and someone comes against you and says, you renounce your faith. And I said, no, I must have more of him. And their life was taken from them. And that's like the perfect ending to a perfect life. Giving everything that you have, even your last breath, for the one who saved you. Also, it could just be simply referring back to chapter 11. You got chapter 11, the the chapter of faith, the hall of fame, the hall of faith, where all these people, it says, they... They believed God. It was credited to them as righteousness, but they never received the reward. They never quite received. It was always, we believe there's a future Messiah coming. We believe there's someone coming, but he's not here yet. And it was so close, but they never quite got it. And so imagine those people now, when they're resurrected, they're going to have glorified bodies, Perfect bodies, sinless bodies. That's just amazing. Moving on, verse 24, the last phrase, it says, You have come to the superior mediator, Jesus. Better than Moses. You have come to sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel's blood. Remember when Cain killed Abel? And it says in Genesis, the blood of Abel was crying out from the ground for justice. God, how long? God, how long? He's crying out to God for justice. Let me read a passage of Scripture real quick. Hebrews chapter 9. So a couple months ago, Hebrews chapter 9, it says, When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and he sprinkled the scroll, and he sprinkled all the people. This is blood. I'm sprinkling blood on you. Can you imagine? What a bloodbath. He sprinkles all this blood on everyone. In the same way, he sprinkled with, oh, he said, verse 20, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Did you ever hear that before? Jesus says it. The new covenant is Jesus' blood washing all of us perfect not just a not just an innocent animal but a sinless representative so good Jesus' sinless perfect holy blood speaks a better word an enduring word an eternal word better than the blood of bulls and goats so real quick i want to compare and contrast then and now then the old covenant Then Sinai, Mount Sinai, now Mount Zion, okay? The first one up here, we have fear and terror. So then Sinai, trembling, fire, smoke, fear. You're going to die if you come close to the mountain. Not even the animals can get close. 
Nobody probably had a cat. Now, it's based on love and forgiveness. Not fear and terror. Then you have earthly things. I already said it. You've got, you've got the mountain. You've got this lightning and thunder and this earthly things is the sign. Now we have heavenly things. We've got a, a home that's coming down out of heaven that's going to be our eternal abode with God. In the old covenant, only Moses draws near. Have everyone else step away. Moses can get close to me. That's it. The New Testament, Jesus says, all who believe, come all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Everyone is welcome. Moses is the mediator. This goes all the way back to the first couple chapters of Hebrews. Jesus is the better, he's superior mediator. We've got a blood of justice, the, the blood of the ground from Abel's crying out for justice. Now, God is still a God of justice. It's not that there is no longer justice. But Jesus is by the blood of mercy. Did any of you deserve to be saved? Did any of you deserve for him to die on the cross for your sins? I didn't deserve it. It's because of his mercy. If I got justice, this one is based on justice. Justice is a good thing. But how many of you want to say, justice is a good thing. So I'm going to live according to justice. Well, tell me this. What do you deserve? What would be justice for you? Because I know it would be justice for me. I don't want that. I will take the mercy. The old covenant is through the blood of animals. The blood of animals? The new covenant is through the blood of Jesus. And lastly, the old covenant is through the law. But the new covenant is through grace. I want to tell you something. An external motivation is never going to be as, fe- as effective as an internal transformation. Old covenant, external motivation. It's never going to be as good or as effective as an internal transformation, which is what Jesus gives to us. And lastly, I want to talk about the last couple of verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 <clears throat> to the end. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape, just pay attention for one more minute. If they did not escape, Old Covenant, when they refused him who warned them on earth, he still got a justice. How much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. This quote, once more I will shake the earth, that's a, it's a quote from Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Haggai prophesied, in the end times there will be a great shaking. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And that verse is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Our God is a consuming fire. He doesn't stop being just. We get mercy. Hallelujah. But there's still justice. And what are we doing with the mercy that he has given us? It says, let us be thankful, okay? What else does it say? Anyone thankful for salvation? A few of you? And because we're thankful for salvation, let us worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. You know, we need the fear of the Lord back in the church. I mean, we... You know, Hebrews is awesome because it has so many things that we just have to hold in tension. Okay, there's a tension. The Bible says we come boldly before the throne. But the Bible says we worship him with reverence and fear and and awe. There's a tension. Both of those things are true. Neither one is more true or less. We hold them in tension. We hold them. I'm going to worship, I'm going to come before God with, with boldness right into his throne room. Right before the throne of grace. I'm also going to worship him with fear and trembling. 
I'm going to summarize all this. One of my commentaries said this. If the law was glorious and profaning it, okay, disobeying or not doing it, profaning it was something to be feared, how much more to be feared is profaning the more awesome glory of the new covenant, which was a gift from heaven. Does that make sense? Are you understanding? So the big idea is also intention. We hold it in tension. The big idea, our God is an all-consuming fire who gives us an unshakable kingdom. He's an all-consuming fire. You better watch out if you got room in your heart that you're feeding to something that God says no to. You better watch out. He's an all-consuming fire. You don't trifle with God. But he's giving us a kingdom that is unshakable if we say yes to him and we live according to his ways. Do you see it? We hold it in tension. Both are true. Listen, there is no such thing as an Old Testament God versus a New Testament Jesus. There's no such thing as Old Testament God was mean and New Testament Jesus is really nice and he's loving. Spoiler alert, they're the same. They're the same God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How he interacts with humanity might be different. He's the same. Have you heard this clever saying before? The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. But the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I think that's in your notes. Write that down. It's just a healthy, fun way of remembering it. You find all these little glimpses of the New Testament hidden throughout the Old Testament. Like, ooh, ooh, oh, I see it now. I see it now. As you're reading the Old Testament, you're like, oh my gosh, that's Jesus. Jewish people who don't even believe in Jesus, if you go and read Isaiah chapter 53 to them, they say, get your New Testament out of here. No, 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 that's not the New Testament. That's your Hebrew scriptures that talk about Jesus. But here's what I want to end with. Church, the scripture says there's a shaking that is coming. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And I'm afraid because in America, comfort for every single person in this room has, including me, has necessarily translated into lukewarmness, uh, lack of dependence upon God, lack of needing him, why would I need him? I have everything I could possibly need right now. I don't rely on God for food. I just go to the grocery store and buy some. Do you know what I'm saying? But there's a shaking coming because there are some countries where you can't go to the grocery store and buy food. There are some countries where there is war right now and they can't meet for church. There are some countries that don't have war and you still can't meet for church because if you do, you'll be killed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why do we think we're special when there are other countries being persecuted right now as we speak? And here we are in a nice warm building finally <laughs> after the last two weeks. Oh, man. Thank God for a warm building, right? We're so spoiled, though. Thank you for all of you who came the last two weeks when it was cold. There's something special about that. At Bible college, we used to have a, a day of, like, they called it fasting, but we had food. Um, where all we ate was like dinty more beef stew and, and white bread. <laughs> and that was like our day of not having the normal comforts of life. We have to pretend, you know, to eat dinty more beef stew like that's like living in lack or something. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> all right. Listen, church. <clears throat> Our children are being taught that there's a hundred genders. Okay, I don't, I'm not here to beat up on anybody. I'm not here to hit anyone over the head with the Bible. But that's not true. And when the Bible says that God made us male and female, and it's a beautiful thing, and we compliment one another, we can't say no to that. And we, or we can't say yes to that and no to God. We have to say no to the world. 
God called us to be out of the world. But we as Christians have been living for so very long with complacency and silence, and we don't want to... We don't want to offend anyone. We we can't talk about politics in the pulpit, and we can't do all these. That's nonsense. Our freedom of speech does not stop when we walk through the building of a church. No, that's nonsense. We have been so quiet for so long. It is time for the church to not be quiet any longer. We cannot be quiet any longer. We have to be bold. We have to be loud. We have to be. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? I'm trying not to. I, do I even need to? I mean, the reason I'm saying these things is because I've been reading this book that you should all go buy, and it will wreck you. Eric Metaxas is the author of a book called Bonhoeffer, and Bonhoeffer was one of the pastors during the Holocaust in Germany, and he started warning the people of Germany. He started warning the pastors of Germany before everything happened. Guys, trouble why is the government taking over our churches? Why is the government flying swastikas in our churches? Why is the government disappearing people? Why is the government, uh, you know, singling out the Jews? Why is the government making people wear stars? Why is it? He's asking his questions, and oh, so many pastors. Oh, oh, Dietrich, just stop. You're causing waves. You're causing problems, Dietrich. Go have some more schnitzel, Dietrich. Dietrich, stop. You're making people uncomfortable, Dietrich. And guess what? Dietrich was made perfect. Because in the midst of preaching the gospel, they killed him. Time for me to be over? (laughs) I get it. Guys, we got to be loud. And we cannot be silent anymore. We did not come to Mount Sinai. We came to this other mountain, which is God's mountain, where one day, if we're faithful and if we're true to what was said and what God has called us to do, we will receive a heavenly city from God that comes down out of heaven, and there will be no more death, no more crying, no more sin, no more shame. Harmony, peace with God forevermore, with all the people that Jesus died for. That's what I want. That's what our church's focus is. To increase the traffic to heaven by creating life-changing communities. That's what we have to do. And we have to stop being silent, church. I'm trying not to yell. I'm trying not to bash. We have to stop being silent. Do you understand? There's lives in the balance. There's trains that are getting ready to go by. You know this, this this new respect for marriage bill? It's just the step before pastors get arrested and silenced. It's the slippery slope to what's going to happen. Pastors will be shut up because we're saying something that the culture has said. That's not nice. I don't apologize for talking too loud or talking too too long. A couple weeks ago, a friend, I was on a Facebook thread, and he said something like, oh, this election, oh, my gosh, we're going to go back to the 50s. And then they said, um, they said, aren't, Aren't you tired of, oh, I forget the phrase now. It said some, something like, aren't you tired of dead, old-fashioned beliefs? I'm like, dead, old-fashioned beliefs. This person believes that freedom of religion is dead and old-fashioned, and we should not be allowed to believe it. You know that's the step before the other step. You know what the next step is? Guys, go buy this book immediately and read it. And let your blood boil and let your... mm, and, And let boldness, the boldness of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Jesus rise up within you. And let us be a church that is standing on the truth, always in love. Always in love. We don't bash anybody with the Bible. We lovingly come to people and say what is true and what is not true. What is what from Jesus and what is not from Jesus. And if they disagree with us, we send them off in love. And we don't hate them and we don't make fun of them. Does everyone understand? Hallelujah. God, we love you and we need you. We need you in this hour. We have never been through this before. We have never been through this before. We have never watched our rights be taken away from us. We have never had to deal with the shaking. 
We think shaking means the gas price is a, is a little bit too high. We think shaking means there's no toilet paper. God, I, I tremble at the thought of what it means to have us actually be shaken. And so, God, I commit this church and myself and my family into your hands and say, God, help us to know what to do when it happens. And until then, we want to be faithful to your word and loud about your truth, always with love. Help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Man, I mean, that guy. I get to be a little bit smarter every time I hang out with Tim, so man, thank you, bud. Um, hey, thank you guys again for coming and hanging out with us. Don't forget, if you're a guest with us, please, please fill out one of these cards. Uh, you can drop them off in the box uh, as you're heading out the doors or swing by guest services. Uh, they'll be glad to take those from you. And uh, man, I'm really excited for next week because next week kicks off our Christmas series. Uh, have you guys been thinking it's starting to feel a lot like Christmas out there? Our tree is up or we got stocking hung and everything. So uh, we can go and throw that up there, uh, Ashlyn. Um, so we're excited. This year's theme is Christmas at the movies. How many of you guys know there's like 8,000 Christmas movies, right? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's no lack of Christmas movies. And, and we enjoy them so much, and I've kind of realized that I think one of the reasons we enjoy them so much is because they always ask the question, well, what's Christmas about? Like, what is it all about? And you watch some movies, and it's about family. And you watch some movies, and it's about, um, you know, it's about you know, giving, not receiving, or whatever it is. And so we've chosen four kind of classic Christmas movies to dissect and look to say, well, what do they say the meaning of Christmas is? And we're going to talk about what the true meaning of Christmas is as well. So this is going to be a very fun series. Kicks off next Sunday all through December. This is the perfect time to start inviting your friends and your family to come. We're having popcorn. Uh, we're going to be showing clips from those movies, and uh, we're going to have invite cards here soon that we would love for you guys to take and go and uh, share in your neighborhoods and in your workplace to come and, and uh, be a part of this series. So um, it all concludes with our Christmas Eve services. Uh, so it'll be a candlelight Christmas Eve service. We'll have one service on the 23rd at 7 p.m. and two services on the 24th at 5 and 7. So again, just another great time to uh, be inviting those people. Now here's what I want to encourage you to do. Remember, if you serve here at LifeQuest, go ahead and decide which one do you want to attend and bring your friends and your family to, and which one do you want to serve at and be a part of welcoming the friends and families of others who are coming. Get with your ministry leaders. Let them know your schedule on that. And uh, just a little insider tr trading information here. Um, the first movie, first Christmas movie we're going to be talking about next Sunday is The Elf with Will Ferrell. How many of you guys have seen The Elf? Oh, man, like... You either love it or you hate it. <laughs> it's an awesome movie. If you haven't seen it or if it's been a while, I want to encourage you to, to check it out. You can rent it for like four bucks on Amazon um, or something like that. But yeah, go ahead and watch that this week. So when you come here on Sunday, you'll kind of you know be uh, informed about that. But it's going to be a glass. Uh, it's going to be a blast. There's going to be popcorn. It's going to be so much fun. Okay, I'm going to pray for you guys. We're going to be dismissed, and we will hang out with you guys next week. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, God, for your challenging word. Thank you, God, that, that you are good enough to just be honest with us. And even when honesty sometimes hurts and is sometimes scary, what we do with that truth, God, either makes us or breaks us as your believers. So, God, I pray if something was said today that pricks our hearts or stirs our spirits and it kind of makes us uncomfortable, rather than stomping our feet and, and, and throwing up our arms and making a big fuss, maybe we pause with you for a minute. And we ask, why is that God? What would you have me change in my life to line closer to your scripture? So God, I just pray over everyone here today. God, I pray that we would just draw a little bit closer to you through this message, and we would look a little bit more like your son as we leave here today. Help us to be champions of you this week, to be inviting those people that need to come to maybe just a more relaxed service environment to have some fun, but also to hear some deep and powerful truths about you. Equip us, Father God, to share our faith boldly and to call good, good, and evil, evil. We love you, Lord. We thank you for everything you're working on and doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Thank you, guys. We will see you next week.